unconditional basic income. It's gaining traction in Europe with Switzerland voting on its implementation later this year and it makes waves whenever discussed. Joining me now in the studio is Natalie Bennett, the leader of the Green Party and advocate of the concept and David Oral, writer and mathematician down the line. Well Natalie, the Green Party is committed to a basic income and this has been your policy for quite some time. So getting straight down to business and if implemented would it save the country money? What it would ensure is every person who has a right to remain in Britain would get enough basic subsistence to live on. So what you're doing is you're taking away the worry, you're taking away the insecurity that is an increasing part of people's lives. Well David, as an economist, do you think that the country could afford this sort of thing? The versions which are being proposed in, in the UK are more in the region of around £7,000 per person. And uh, I believe that that could probably be paid for uh, just out of the out of replacing existing benefits, at least mostly. So Natalie, do you agree with David? Is this your concept of basic income and do you have a figure in mind? The problem we've got in Britain particularly is the issue of housing costs. It's not possible at those kind of levels to replace housing benefit at the moment. So you've really got to look at citizens' income as part of a much broader restructuring of the way our economy works. So how do you propose to finance this then? Two things. There's the existing benefits like job seekers allowance, single parent support, those kind of benefits. And there's also the huge costs of administering those things at the moment. You take that cost away and the Citizen Income Trust has calculated that you could administer basic income at a cost of 1% of the total benefit, which is about the same as child benefit. And you know that gives you a, quite a bit of money, not the full sum, but quite a bit of money that you can put into the actual payments to people. Well, David, do you think this is reasonable or do you think if it was implemented, we could expect taxes to rise quite a lot? I, I think th I think it's reasonable because there are some other effects as, as well. I mean, um, for example, a, a problem with our current benefit system is that it, well, first of all, it stigmatizes people, you know, for having to collect benefits. But then it also acts as an incentive often to, to not seek employment because if you get a job, your, your benefits will, will be cut. And that wouldn't be a problem with a basic income scheme because you would just get extra money. Well, Natalie, I did hear during an interview that you said unconditional basic income could change people's behavior, that a sewer cleaner might be paid more than a banker. And maybe this is fair and reasonable. I think that was the quote. But this seems like an interesting comparison to me because one of these jobs is unskilled. The other takes years of study and dedication to achieve. So surely this is quite demotivational, really. A uh, sewer cleaner, it's a job that maybe not many people want to do. I, I would perhaps question whether it's unskilled, but that's a sort of extreme example. But if you take what we hear about terrible call centres, the kind of places where they time you when you go to, go to the loo and, you know, every call has to be less than 54 seconds. And we've all been victims of those kind of call centres. And if people don't want to work in those kind of work environments anymore, you very much have to improve the work environment. And uh, David, what do you think unconditional basic income would mean then for businesses that rely on minimum wage labour? If jobs are really undesirable, then they would have to pay more. Other, you know, other jobs, maybe people would be willing to work for less because they would have this basic income and they could therefore actually charge less and charge a lower wage potentially. The biggest trends at the moment is that uh, large amounts of jobs are being automated, not just in car manufacturing and, and things like that, but you know, it's really accelerating a lot now. The, the price of uh, automation, robots, all this kind of thing is decreasing a lot. And so if you sort of look at the trends, there's going to be less and less of these super low skilled jobs in the future. And then, and then you have to ask, well, if people aren't doing that kind of work, I mean, first of all, how are you going to handle the unemployment? Under our current scheme, the unemployment benefits would, would go through the roof. You know, with something like this, I would think the, the impact would actually be be lower. Well, Natalie, I just want to bring you slightly back to minimum wage for a moment here. And do you think if unconditional basic income were implemented, then maybe large corporations might campaign to actually lower minimum wage? We need to make sure that if corporations aren't freeloading, and the problem in Britain is our minimum wage is less than a living wage. You can work for 40 hours a week and not be paid enough money to basically live. And that actually means that things like housing benefit and family tax credit at the moment are actually corporate welfare, which are going straight into the profits of often very large companies that are paying too low a wage. So what we very much need to do is actually make, you know, now, before we get to the basic income, we need to make the minimum wage a living wage. And we need to make sure that people weren't being exploited under, under a system with a basic or citizen's income. Well, David, looking at inflation now, and if unconditional basic income was introduced, surely the first thing corporations would do is raise prices, making this proposal redundant. From a sort of macro level, by money supply, and money supply won't be changed by this because because as I say it's sort of replacing other things you know it's not printing new money the way something like quantitative easing is 
it would increase the velocity of money, if you like, the, the, the speed at which money is changing hands uh, because the, uh, there'd be more of an impact on people with, with low incomes. And so that could have a bit of an inflationary impact. But I would think that the effects are going to be kind of mixed. And, and uh, as I say, I think it would be relatively small scale compared to other things. But, but I think, David, what you're saying there implies that much else in our economy is going to remain the same. And that's simply not the case, because one of the other things we've got to bring into this is the fact that at the moment in Britain, we live what's known as the three planet lifestyle. In the US, it's four. So that means that people are actually consuming every year the resources, the equivalent resources of three planets. And one of the things that citizens' income can do is because there's a security net, you don't have to worry so much that you, you can actually, you know, think about reducing your working hours, consuming less stuff and get more time in return. And so you know, we have to look at all of this as a package as of not just assuming that things are going to go on as they are now, because they're not. We're going to have to see radical changes to fit within the limits of our one planet and to reshape our society because you know, inequality at the moment is at a huge, enormous level and rising very fast. We've gone past Edwardian levels and heading for Victorian. But do you think basic income could have any dent whatsoever on the wealth gap in real terms? It's a foundation and I think we sort of got away from how we fund it. But you know, I think you do need to ensure that rich individuals and multinational comp corporations pay much more tax. And that has to happen you know, anyway because we do have to deal with this work inequality which even organisations like the IMF and World Bank say are threatening our, our whole global economy. Well, Natalie, my final question for you is, if unconditional basic income, there's such a strong case for it, then why haven't the three main political parties sort of got on board with this? There's a lot of very good ideas around whether it's bringing the railways back into public hands, something that has you know, about 70% public support, uh, keeping the NHS, the National Health Service in Britain, publicly owned and publicly run. There's huge amounts of ideas that are very, have very strong public support, are great ideas, and citizens or basic income is one of those, less well known among the public service certainly, but a, but a great idea. But we have at the moment in Britain a politics that's very much stuck in the 20th century, stuck in the ideas of privatisation, neoliberalism, globalisation. And we're headed into a very different world in the 21st century. And I'm afraid at the moment our three largest political parties just haven't caught up with that. Natalie, David, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.